I guess it's about time to start. So I'd like to welcome everyone to the Oxford Set Theory Seminar. Uh, uh, this is a new seminar and I'm just gonna introduce myself today. Uh, I'm speaking and uh, so I'm gonna share my screen here. Let's see, is this it? Um, okay, so I hope everyone can see that screen. And just for the record, uh, we're recording this video um, and we're gonna post it on YouTube. Vika's talk from two weeks ago is on the YouTube channel and you can find the videos on my blog uh, at the Set Theory Seminar post. Uh, and this one will eventually make it there as well. Um, as far as handling questions is concerned, well, I'm gonna be speaking and I'm gonna try to pay attention, but I can't see everyone on my screen at one time. So uh, please feel free to interject with a question or a comment. If you want, just unmute yourself and ask the question. Um, and I think uh, we'll just try to see how that goes, but I think it, it'll work pretty well. So please uh, feel free to ask questions uh, in the middle and uh, I'm happy to, to handle any kind of questions. So I'm gonna be speaking on the topic of by interpretation of weak set theories. And so I'll just uh, go ahead and start. This is a, a portrait that I think uh, shows something about what I'm talking about with by interpretation. So the uh, artist is sort of interpreted in these various uh, models. This is joint work with uh, Alfredo Roca Friera, who is here uh, at the seminar today. He was visiting me in New York when we did most of this work and also came to Oxford uh, where we um, completed some of it. So, <clears throat> right, I wanna talk about the interpretation phenomenon in set theory. And let's begin by reviewing what does it mean to interpret one model in another or one theory in another. This is a very general model theoretic concept, uh, which makes sense with any kind of model or theory, not just set theory. So I'll start with some easy examples, maybe familiar examples. The complex field is interpretable in the real field, as I'm sure most of you are aware. Uh, if you have a complex number A plus BI, then of course you can represent that with uh, a pair of real numbers, uh, A comma B, thinking, thinking of it as the complex plane. And then of course the point is that we can define the complex algebraic operations of addition and multiplication on those pairs in terms of the real field operations so as to mimic the complex field structure. And so this is a way, if you live in the real numbers only and you only give yourself the right to talk about real numbers and addition and multiplication on the real numbers, then you can nevertheless, uh, in effect, talk about a copy of the complex numbers by the talking about pairs. And so you define a copy of the complex field inside the real field. Um, now, Conversely, it's not actually true that the real field is interpretable in the complex field uh, uh, as a field only. And um, in fact, the, the real field is not, of course, not a definable subfield of the complex numbers because there's automorphisms that move the irrational real numbers to other complex numbers that aren't real. And so it can't be uh, a definable subfield, even if you allow parameters. But in fact, a stronger fact is that you cannot even interpret uh, the real field in the complex field. And this has to do with the <clears throat> abundance of automorphisms of the complex field. I made a blog post about that a few months ago. Um, so the real field is of course interpretable in the complex uh, numbers in the complex plane, or if you add conjugation, for example, of course you can define the reals as a subfield. They're fixed by the conjugation. Or if you uh, give yourself the coordinate structure of the real and imaginary part, then of course you can define uh, the real field that way. So some other simple examples, uh, the integer ring is of course interpretable in the natural numbers. You can think of every integer as the difference between two natural numbers. And so we can think of the pair nm as representing the difference n minus m, and then we have the same difference equivalence relation which is expressible in terms of just the addition of the natural numbers and integer addition and multiplication can be uh, well-defined with respect to the same difference relation. So this is a way while staying just in the natural numbers of talking about the integers using only the uh, structure available in, in the natural number structure. Of course, the rational field is interpretable in the integer ring as the quotient field. We think of a rational number as a pair of of integers, a fraction, and then we have the same ratio relation. 
and we can define addition and multiplication of rationals, of course, referring only to uh, the structure that's available to us uh, in the integer ring. So these are all, I think, completely familiar examples. Um, here's a set theoretic example. The structure of hereditarily finite sets is interpretable in arithmetic, in the standard model of arithmetic. Um, this is by means of the Ackerman relation. So we say that n, so now we think of natural numbers as representing sets, hereditarily finite sets, and we say that n is an element of m or is e related to m just in case the nth binary digit of m is one. So therefore zero, the number zero, isn't gonna have any elements at all. It will represent the empty set and, uh, and, and, and so on. To tell what the elements of a number are, you look at the binary representation and you look where the ones are and then the, the sets that those numbers represent, those digit places represent are the elements of the set. And in this way, you see the, the structure of all hereditarily finite sets is isomorphic to just the natural numbers under this E relation. And then, of course, the main point is that this E relation is definable in the standard model of arithmetic. So therefore, uh, in arithmetic, we can talk about hereditarily finite sets by means of this interpretation. Okay, the general definition is that one structure is interpreted in another if there's a definable copy of that structure inside M. And what I mean by that is if this is the structure with relation symbols and functions and constant symbols and so on, then it's isomorphic to a certain quotient n star is a definable set of k-tuples in M, and the, these relational, uh, the relational structures are definable relations on that domain n star inside that, uh, inside that structure, and the equivalence relation is a congruence with respect to all of that structure and also M definable. So that's what it means to, to interpret one structure inside another. So this is represented in this picture. We're interpreting n and M, the grid here is representing the equivalence classes by that equivalence relation and all of the structural elements that you need here are definable in the structure M. Okay, in certain kinds of theories, some of the issues simplify in what's called a sequential theory, such as arithmetic or set theory. You don't really need k-tuples anymore because you can code k-tuples internally. I mean, in, in arithmetic, we can code k-tuples just with single numbers, so we don't ever need the k-tuples when we're forming the interpretation because we can just use the internal code of that k-tuple. Um, another kind of thing that happens is that if you have global choice or uh, definable skolem functions, for example, then you can eliminate the need for the equivalence relation because you can just pick always the least element uh, of any equivalence class. And if the, if the choice function is sufficiently definable, then that's gonna be a definable representative. And so you don't need the quotients uh, in that kind of case. So even in ZF, where you don't necessarily have global choice, because in the general case, of course, the equivalence class might be a proper class. So the axiom of choice isn't really good enough to pick the representative. You need a kind of uniform way of, of picking representatives from every equivalence class. And that's why it's about global choice. Um, but in ZF, you don't even need global choice because you can use Scott's trick and always take, for example, the set of epsilon minimal representatives from any equivalence class that's not a representative from the equivalence class, but it's a kind of stand-in for the equivalence class, which is good enough, and it's a set, and so therefore you don't need the equivalence relation because you can represent every equivalence class with a set. So in general, you can't eliminate the equivalence relations in ZFC minus, that's, that's set theory without the power set axiom, and that's gonna come up a bit later. Okay. So if I have two structures, then they're said to be mutually interpretable if each of them is interpreted in the other. So I can interpret N inside M, I have a copy of it by possibly a quotient, and I have a copy of M inside N, uh, maybe by its quotient, a definable quotient. That's the case of mutual interpretability. So now, of course, you can, whenever you have mutual interpretation, you can naturally iterate this. So if you have two structures M and N and you can interpret N inside M, let me just suppress the quotient part of it um, and you can interpret M inside N. Well, then this, this M star bit here is going to be interpreted inside N star. It's gonna be carried to an interpretation inside N star by this interpretation J. And so we're gonna get an isomorphism of M. Of course, M is isomorphic to this structure 
which is then carried over here. So we have an isomorphism between M to this structure that's interpreted inside the interpreted structure inside M. And similarly, on the other side, N is isomorphic to its interpreted structure. This is what I mean by iterating. So each of the models is isomorphic to its iterated interpreted copy by just composing those interpretations. Now the difference between mutual interpretation and by interpretation is precisely the question of whether those iterated maps are definable or not. With mutual interpretation, all you have is that the model is isomorphic to this iterated copy. But with by interpretation, you have that that isomorphism is definable inside M. This is the crucial difference between mutual interpretation and by interpretation. Okay, so it's a slightly cleaner picture if we identify the model N, the second one, with its copy inside the first. So we start with the structure M and we have the other structure N as a definable, possibly a definable quotient, definable structure inside M. And then inside that one, we have a interpreted copy of M. And inside that one, we have an interpreted copy of N and so on. We can just keep doing this. We get this sort of fractal situation where each model is interpreted uh, in the next. Um, and this picture makes sense for either mutual interpretation or by interpretation, but the difference again is that with by interpretation, these maps are definable inside the structure in which they exist. So models are said to be by interpretation synonymous, also called definitionally equivalent. Uh, if there's a by interpretation, so that's this mutual interpretation thing where the maps are definable, um, for which the domains of the interpreted structures are in each case the whole structure and the equivalence relation is equality. So that's a special case. We're not actually using only part of the structure for the interpretation. We're just defining the, the fundamental relations and structure of the other model on the whole domain. So that's a, called by interpretation synonymy. Uh, and it turns out that every instance of by interpretation between models of zermelo frankel set theory can be transformed into an instance of by interpretation synonymy. And the reason is, well, first of all, you don't need k-tuples ever because it's a sequential theory and you can code the k-tuples inside set theory. Um, and you don't need the equivalence relations because of the Scott's trick uh, that I mentioned earlier. Um, and, and therefore, we have, we have basically a model of set theory and it's interpreting another model of set theory inside it. And this one is interpreted inside the other way. But therefore, by the Kanner schroeder bernstein theorem, we have a definable bijection between those classes. And therefore, uh, we can use that bijection to pull the structure back and make the interpreted structure use the whole domain. And that would be uh, an instance of by interpretation synonymy. Okay, it's, I've so far been talking about interpreting structures, but it's maybe more traditional to talk about interpretations of theories rather than models. And let me explain what that means. So one theory is interpreted in another if there's a kind of uniform way of doing what I just described. So there's a uniform definition which works inside any model of T2. We can use that definition to define a domain and, a, and structural relations and equivalence relation on that domain such that the quotient is gonna give us a model of T1. So to interpret a theory is just a uniform way of doing the kind of interpretation of models that we've been talking about so far. Um, so, I mean, maybe more specifically, we have a kind of translation of, of the L2 formulas because of course, when we talk about interpreting theories, then there's no, and in even models, there's no, uh, expectation that the language of the, of the two models should be the same. It can be totally different kind of model, totally different theory, totally different signature. What we really need to do is have a kind of translation from the, um, uh, uh, from the one language into the other. So if we're interpreting one theory T1 inside T2, then we should have L2 formulas that define the domain of K tuples uh, that's going to be used to define the L1 structure, and we should have a translation from the L1 uh, atomic uh, uh, formulas to L2 formulas that say when it holds on the interpretation, and so one can extend that then to a full translation of the L1 assertions into the language of L2. So we're translating L1 assertions into L2 assertions in such a way that the 
um, the any theorem of T1, uh, T2 proves its interpreted copy. So this is what it means uh, to have an interpretation of theory. Sorry, Joel, can I just ask kind of a dumb question to make sure I'm understanding? Sure. Corey, go ahead. Um, in the case of just sort of a, a model of set theory, if I think about, for example, like the, the copy of L inside of it with the definition of L, I'm getting an interpretation of V equals L inside of whatever my model is. Yes, exactly right. Yeah, that's okay. a canonical instance of interpretation. All right. so in but other words, in terms of the theories, ZFC plus V equal L is interpretable in ZF. Okay, thank you. But then going the other way, I mean, if I have a forcing extension, that's not necessarily going to be interpretable because sort of the Boolean valuation is not. I'm going to talk valuation. about precisely that issue uh, later on. Okay. So it seems I'll hold up naively, you would say no, it's not an interpretation, but in fact, uh, uh, there is a way of realizing it as an interpretation. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Okay. So, so theories are mutually interpretable if each of them can be interpreted in the other. And they're bi-interpretable if, if they're mutually interpretable in such a way that also there's a, a definable isomorphism of each model to its interpreted copy uh, via the other interpretation. So going, going, interpreting to the other model and then interpreting again, then you should have a definable isomorphism from the original universe to that interpreted structure that you did by doing that. That's what bi-interpretation means. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Here it is right here. Uh, Right, so the theory should prove that the universe is isomorphic by that definable isomorphism map. Um, okay, so let's talk about interpretation in set theory. So we talked a little, Corey brought up a little bit of, about this and please again, feel free to ask uh, questions uh, in the middle, I'm happy to go on. I can only see like three or four people on my screen at one time, so I'm sorry about that. Uh, so the basic fact is that there's an extremely robust mutual interpretability phenomenon in set theory. Uh, so here's just a kind of uh, example. All of these theories are pairwise mutually interpretable. Um, so ZF or ZFC or generalized continuum hypothesis, the axiom of constructibility or the failure of AC or failure of CH. Martin's axiom, you can have the bounding number less than bounding number and so on. We have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of instances of mutually uh, uh, interpretable theories in set theory. And of course, there's corresponding theorems for uh, theories with higher consistency strength. If you want to look at large cardinals and determinacy or something like that, or super compact cardinals or indestructible super compact cardinals and so on, we have uh, in interpret interpretations between these various theories in a way that I'll explain. Um, okay, so, so basically we have thousands of these equiconsistency and relative consistency results. This is the usual way of talking about it is in terms of equiconsistency or relative consistency, but in fact almost all of these results can be recast as mutual interpretation and interpretability results. And furthermore, my opinion is that the interpretability formulations of these results are first of all stronger mathematically and philosophically, uh, they tend to be more robust. And so my suggestion is that perhaps we should be talking rather less in set theory about equiconsistency and talking rather more about uh, interpretability because that's what we're getting from the proofs. So let me explain that. Of course, the easy case of interpretability is the case that we just mentioned when the interpreted model is true in a definable inner model. So for example, ZFC is interpretable in ZF because in any model of zermelo franco set theory, we can define the constructible universe. And in that universe, uh, we have also the axiom of choice. And so uh, and ZF proves that, um, the instance of that. And so therefore um, we have an interpretation of ZFC in ZF. And similarly with the continuum hypothesis by the same interpretation because CH and even GCH and much, much more of course is true in L. Okay, but also for example, we can, define the canonical inner model of a measurable cardinal, and that's interpretable in ZFC plus there is a measurable cardinal. Um, uh, so this is the case, the easy case of a definable inner model, uh, which gives interpretation. So meanwhile, forcing I claim also provides an interpretation method, and that's maybe a little harder to see, but I wanna explain it carefully. Um, 
forcing is usually conceived as a way to define outer models rather than inner models. I mean, usually you start with a model and then you define the for you talk about how to build the forcing extension. And so that wouldn't be an interpretation of the forcing extension inside the original model. And furthermore, the traditional countable transitive model approach to forcing where in the meta theory, you take some finite fragment of ZFC, for example, uh, this is putting most of the forcing technology into the meta theory and that method tends to obs obscure, in my opinion, the underlying interpretability aspect of the result. But nevertheless, one can use forcing to define interpreted models by means of the Boolean ultra power. So suppose you have a forcing notion B inside a model M, then let U be any ultra filter on B, any ultra filter at all. There's no need for genericity. In fact, U being an element of M is completely fine. Then you can form the class of B names. That's MB. That's going to be the domain I'm going to use. And uh, my equivalence relation is going to be equivalence mod U. So two names are U equivalent if the Boolean value that they're equal is an element of U. And, uh, and then my definable relation is uh, one name is a is an element of tau with respect to u if the boolean value that it's an element is an element of u. This is not the same forming say equivalence classes by this relation when u is not generic is not the same as the the value construction that one often sees enforcing the the recursive definition of the value of the name of a set by a generic filter defined as the values of the elements of that name uh, as long as the boolean value that they are an element is in the generic filter that is a different construction and it's never the same as this construction um, uh, when u is not generic but the point is that m can do this construction even though it doesn't have any generic filters. Now, you can just prove the Walsh theorem for this interpretation by induction, it's just like normal. And the, the quotient structure that we define in this way satisfies a formula if and only if the Boolean value that that formula is true is an element of the ultra filter. So this is just like the classical Walsh theorem um, for for ultra powers on a power set, which is a complete Boolean algebra and therefore a forcing notion. But as a forcing notion, of course, the, the power set algebra is, is atomic, it's trivial as a forcing notion, but the point is that the same, the same construction works even when B is not atomic. Okay, and so the point is that this quotient structure satisfies everything that's forced by B meaning that it's forced with Boolean value one. In fact, it satisfies everything that's true uh, with a Boolean value that's in U. So this gives an interpretation of this structure, which can be thought of as the forcing extension. Okay, so let me just um, so illustrate. Uh, Joel, can I ask yes. a question? So this seems to be an interpretation with parameters. Yes, exactly, but I'm gonna explain in this example how to get rid of that. Okay, thanks. So I don't know how to always get rid of it, but in many, many cases, you can, the, you can use definable parameters. Oh, yeah, um, sure. Okay, thanks. So, so for example, uh, you can interpret CFC plus not CH in CFC. So even if you start in L, for example, you're not going to find an inner model where the continuum hypothesis fails. This is exactly the hard case of going to the inner model. You need to go, you seem to need to go to the outer model, but in fact, you don't because to avoid the parameters, we can define the Boolean ultra power over a definable inner model. You give me any model of ZFC, I can define L, and then I can define the forcing that adds omega too many Cohen reals. That's definable in the original model. It's definable in L and therefore definable in the original model. And there's also an L least ultra filter on that Boolean completion of that forcing notion. So both U and B are definable and then I, therefore this structure, this quotient structure is definable in the original model M, arbitrary model of CFC. And it's gonna be a model of CFC plus not CH precisely because not CH is forced by this forcing over L with Boolean value one. So, okay. And a similar thing happens with many, many different forcing notions for, for a lot of the forcing results that are giving you uh, equi consistency results, then really you can use Boolean ultra power to, re to, to get a, a mutual interpretation of these theories. And that's how you prove that theorem that I mentioned at the beginning. Uh, okay, so go I, ahead. Uh, what's the construction principle of natural numbers, though? 
I'm sorry, say it again. Uh, I didn't quite. Would this construction be sort of natural numbers? Uh, I'm sorry, I, I didn't quite get something about the natural numbers. Oh, is it? Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. So, if, um, so does the natural numbers as interpreted model are the same as the initial natural numbers? Or no, not? not necessarily. Sometimes, yes. So, I have some papers, for example, in which if you have a strongly compact cardinal, then for any forcing notion which is called kappa concern, uh, I'm sorry, kappa friendly, for any kappa friendly forcing notion, which includes a huge class of forcing notions that you want to do with that kind of cardinal, uh, then you can find well founded. Boolean ultra powers. You can you can find a U for which the Boolean ultra power is well founded, and then it actually is giving you an inner model, and it will have the standard omega, and and uh, the, the all the ordinals will be well founded, and so on inside that interpreted structure. Um, but in the general case, it's not possible, and this is a point I'm going to be making later. There's a sort of necessary move when you do these interpretations. Uh, to ill-founded models. If you iteratively interpret by means of these things, you will end up at ill-founded models, including ill-founded omega. Um, can I also make a comment on that? Sure, um, please. Um, I mean, it seems to me that to ask whether the natural numbers are preserved by an interpretation, it's not clear that this is well-defined, but if it's well-defined, the way I would have because well, the question about, is whether it's an omega model, or is it still, well, is the new it omega the standard? the same question, but the way I would interpret it is the following, that the theory of the natural numbers is interpreted in the original model, and it's sure. also interpreted in the other model, and you can ask whether in fact there's an interpretation, hopefully by interpretation of the natural numbers in themselves, which communes with that, and to that, the answer seems to me it might be yes. No? Yeah, because forcing doesn't change arithmetic truth. Yeah. And so the yeah. theory, the new, even if the new model of arithmetic in the interpreted model, if it's coming from forcing, then uh, the new arithmetic will have it all and only the same. Yeah, truth so as in that sense, it does preserve that natural number in yeah. the interpretation. Thing. I mean, and much more, you know, Schoenfield absoluteness is going to give you the same sigma one, two theory. Even. Sure. Sure. So it, it goes higher. So, and then if your forcing notion is nice, you get more more preservation even than that. Yeah. Okay. So so we have this rich mutual interpretability phenomenon in set theory. Uh, we can go back and forth between models of AC with and without CH and so on. Um, and my initial question here is: Do these instances of mutual interpretation rise to the level of by interpretation? In other words, are we getting by interpretation or not? Of course. By interpretation is what we really want. This is the sense, you know, models are by interpretable means that if you have one of them, basically you have the other, it's just as good. And, uh, and the, in some sense, it's the same. Everything you could do with the other model, you can do with the first model if they're by interpretable because you can see exactly uh, how the models are carried back and forth by the interpretation. Mutual interpretation doesn't have that feature. So we really want by interpretation, and the question is, are we getting it or not? So, in particular, uh, well, so far in the set theory sorry. cases, I would sure. Uh, I, I'm sorry. Uh, could you repeat what you just said about mutual uh, that uh, the heuristic dif uh, difference between mutual interpretation and by interpretation? Sorry, I missed it. Yes, yeah, it's a, the critical difference. Mutual interpretation is just that each of the models is interpreted in the other, or each of the theories is interpreted in the other. By interpretation is like that, plus the model is isomorphic to its copy after doing the interpretation and coming back. And furthermore, the model can see the isomorphism that it is the same model. So, so the, you have a model, you interpret the other structure, and then you interpret uh, the original model inside that one. And those models are isomorphic by a, an isomorphism, which is definable. That's what it means to be bi-interpretable, where the, you get the definability of that isomorphism. Okay, Joel, can I, can I ask a quick question? Sure. Um, what's the difference between mutual um, interpretability and equiconsistency, uh, which you mentioned earlier, or are there any? Um, right, equiconsistency, cases? I mean, different people mean slightly different things by it, but so two theories are equiconsistent, basically, if, if the consistency of one of them implies the consistency of the other, and conversely. 
So the consistency statements right. are equivalent, right? So are there any examples of um, equi Of course, if you have mutual statements. interpretability, then they're going to be equi-consistent because exactly. if you have a model of one, you can get a model of the other. Exactly. So are there any examples of equi-consistency uh, yeah. okay, that see. are not mutual? If I may, the, there is an, uh, an example, which is uh, uh, the godot bernay set theory and ZF are mutually Oh, are equiconsistent, equiconsistent, but ZF cannot interpret Gödel-Bernays set theory. Because wow. okay. there's a kind of uniformity okay. that, involved in the when you want to talk about the classes. I see. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there is no way to uniformly uh, bring the 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 tools of NB genes uh, of Gödel-Bernays inside ZF. That's, that's exactly right. And by the okay. way, that's Alfredo, my co-author that I mentioned at the beginning. He's the co-author on this paper. Is mm -hmm. the is the example that was just given with ZF and Gödel Bernays, is that just a matter of Gödel Bernays being finitely axiomatizable? So if you have an interpretation, yes. would you uh, have much of ZF? Yes. Yes, this is a consequence of that. Thank because you. of okay. these, together with the reflexive principle, then you can uh, uh, extract a contradiction from this. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I mean, I view it also as a uniformity issue, though, because if you had an interpretation of, of Gerda Bernays in ZFC, then you would have, in effect, a uniform enumeration of all the classes. And then you could diagonalize against that, and that would contradict Gerda Bernays. It's another way of, of seeing what's going on. So, so can I... Can I can I just check this um and this by interpretation again? I know you've tried to explain it. So you've got two theories S and T. You I understand you've got um so you've got a translation, an interpretation each way, and you said that you require this there and back thing to be definable. So that so there should be a definable relation in T, say, that okay. says if I map X right. to to I, I should relate every X to a unique Y, which is uh, inside the structure in the mo in the interpreted model of T inside the interpreted model right. of S so that T, I did. Right. So T has to T has to prove that this. Has, so T, you have to have definable two place relation in T, and it, T has to prove that it's um, a bijection. Yes. And does and, T have and to prove an isomorphism? Yeah. Okay. T has to prove that it's an isomorphism. Okay. And similarly with S. I mean, it has right. to work both ways. Right. Uh, there okay. is a uh, when you look. In the theory, uh, uh, sorry if I uh, go ahead. But, uh, as you as you see the case of theories, uh, a nice thing that you get when you when you think about this phenomenon is that when you have a, a mutual interpretation, sometimes you go into the other theory, and when you come back, you are not in the original theory, but in the extension of the theory, um, and. The by interpretation, it's it's a little bit more than that. But in a by interpretation case, when you go to the other theory and you come back using the 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 other interpretation, then you are in exactly the same theory as you were before. Like it preserves the 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 theory as it is in the level of theories, not in the model level. Okay, let me let me go on because I think we're going to revisit many of these issues. So. Um, okay, I just want to mention this small fact, namely, there's a kind of automatic bi-interpretability phenomenon for well-founded models. If you have a well-founded model of set theory and you don't even need power set, if it's ever interpreted inside itself, then that isomorphism is automatically definable and in fact unique. And the proof is that basically it's just the Mostovsky collapse of the interpreted structure because it's a well-founded model and it is isomorphic, then that isomorphism is going to be exactly the Mostovsky collapse, which the model can define. It's a little more subtle because the equivalence classes are a complicating factor, but basically one can do it. And so let me just skip this proof because I don't think we're gonna have time for everything anyways. Okay, but it's just, the isomorphism is definable in that case. So this automatic by interpretability phenomenon, then every instance of mutual interpretation amongst the well-founded models is automatically a by interpretation uh, precisely for the reason that I just explained. Okay, so let's go now to ZF. So we have this robust mutual interpretation phenomenon in set theory. 
And I'm just going to tell you the fact is that there is basically no non-trivial bi-interpretation phenomenon to be found. And it's because of the following theorem, uh, which was proved first by Ali Eniyat, who is here today. Um, so he proved that distinct non-isomorphic models of ZF are never bi-interpretable with each other. And that's what it means to say that this theory is solid. It has no uh, non-isomorphic bi-interpretable models. And furthermore, distinct theories extending ZF are never bi-interpretable. So in particular, ZFC and ZF are not bi-interpretable. ZFC plus CH or without CH, those are not bi-interpretable. The only time uh, you get bi-interpretation of theories is if the theories are actually the same to begin with, which is just a trivial case. So let me prove the theorem. Uh, distinct models are never bi-interpretable. Suppose we have M and N and they are bi-interpretable. So I have this iterated by interpretation and these maps are definable. Uh, well, I claim N has to look at the epsilon relation of M bar as well-founded because whatever set N has of a subset of M bar, M also has that set and it can see how it is a subset of, of M bar. And therefore M can pull that set back to M and by foundation axiom in M can get a least element and then the image of that least element will be a least element that N can see. So therefore, the interpreted set membership relation is, of M bar is going to be well-founded in N. And therefore, it follows that the ordinals of those models are going to be comparable. And so, for example, if I have an ordinal in M, well, of course, it, it has its isomorphic copy in M bar. And if it happens to be isomorphic to an ordinal of N, alpha star, then I claim by induction, the V alpha hierarchies of those models all are isomorphic to each other. And that's very easy to see because if it's true at alpha, then all of these models can see the same subsets because they can all see all the interpretations and they can pull sets back and forth and so on. They all have isomorphic power sets. So you can go to alpha plus one. And furthermore, these are transitive sets in the respective models and therefore rigid. So the isomorphisms are unique. And at limit stages, the uniqueness gives you the isomorphism uh, of the limit. So, uh, so therefore, if one of the models runs out of ordinals first, then, then the taller one will have a bijection. So then that shorter model will be isomorphic to some V alpha in the taller model. And the taller model thinks that there's an injection from the whole universe into the set, which is a contradiction. Uh, so therefore, and it's also similar the other way, so therefore they must have the same height and therefore they're isomorphic. So that's, that's why they can't be bi-interpretable unless they're isomorphic to begin with. And then it follows that ZF is tight. So, uh, and the reason is just every solid theory is tight. If you, have, if you have models, if you can't have any models that are bi-interpretable, then of course you can't have distinct theories, incompatible theories that are uh, bi-interpretable. Okay. So, so in particular, ZF is not bi-interpretable with ZFC, nor with ZFC plus CH or without and so on. None of these theories are bi-interpretable. Um, the, if you have ZFC plus large cardinals, you're not gonna bi-interpret that with determinacy axioms or canonical inner models. Those are not bi-interpretations, although they are mutual interpretations. So let me just tell you a little about the history. So Albert Visser proved the result for PA it's considerably easier, I think, in PA because there's no limit case and so on, and you just have numbers. If you have two models of arithmetic and they can see each other, then they can build that isomorphism uniquely. And it's, it's a very similar argument, but a much easier argument, I think. Then Ali proved it for ZF, specifically ZF and ZFC are not bi-interpretable using a very clever argument about the automorphism groups because he noticed that uh, models of ZFC never have involutions in their automorphism group, but models of ZF can. And uh, by interpretations carry the automorphism group structure along. And so that was an impossibility. Then he proved the general theorem that I just mentioned and also in other cases like KM and some other cases than that. Uh, also, I guess the theorem was observed independently by Friedman and Visser and uh, also independently by Fyodor Bakhamov. And also it was observed independently by Alfredo and myself before we realized that, uh, that Ali had already proved this theorem. Yeah, so, um, okay, also I'm gonna explain in a few slides how the theorem follows from the internal categoricity results of Yoko Vanonen. 
So, okay. So we had seen the mutual interpretability amongst diverse models, but uh, the claim is that well-founded models of CF, and this goes back to this omega model question, well-founded models of CF are never mutually interpretable unless they're isomorphic. Um, and the reason is that if they were mutually interpretable, then because of the automatic bi-interpretability phenomenon, they would have to be bi-interpretable, but models are never bi-interpretable unless they're isomorphic. So therefore, if you wanna stay with well-founded models, you cannot even use mutual interpretation. It just doesn't happen unless the models are the same to begin with. Okay, so the way I interpret this is that interpretation involves a necessary loss of information um, because, well, we have all these instances of mutual interpretation amongst all those different theories that I mentioned, but the point is that you cannot stay with well-founded models when you do that for the reason that I said. You can never get back to the original model if it was well-founded because if you could, then it would have been a bi-interpretation and there, therefore it's impossible. So when you follow these interpretations, you must always be um, uh, losing the information of the original model. So you can't go back home. Okay, let me talk about the Van Anen result. So this is a nice theorem. Uh, I think I saw him speak on this in Aberdeen a number of years ago at that conference. That was great. So, okay, if you have a model of set theory with two membership relations, and it's a model of the double ZF theory, and by this I mean, um, uh, we mean ZF using epsilon as the membership relation and using this one as a binary class predicate. So we have the replacement axiom for this relation using this class predicate, you know, we're allowed to refer to that class predicate, but also asserting ZF axioms in, with respect to epsilon bar as the membership relation using this epsilon relation as a class predicate. So we have two different membership relations and we have ZF for both of them. Um, uh, then actually the, the membership relations are isomorphic is the conclusion of the theorem. And furthermore, it's unique. Okay, so this is explaining the hypothesis a little more carefully. Uh, we use either one of the relations as a membership relation and we use the other one as a class parameter to, that's allowed to appear, say, in instances of the replacement axiom or the separation axiom. Okay, let's give a proof. So we have a model of that double membership theory, then I claim they're isomorphic. And the proof is that, uh, well, suppose we have a model of the theory then I claim each of them looks at the other one as well-founded because they have all the same sets. They can see all the same sets as each other. And therefore, uh, since, since ep the epsilon structure thinks that every class really has an epsilon minimal element, then the epsilon bar structure can see that fact. And therefore the epsilon bar structure will think that epsilon is actually well-founded and, and conversely. Um, and therefore their ordinals must be comparable so let's say that the epsilon one is, is, is not taller, then uh, every epsilon ordinal corresponds to an epsilon bar ordinal because of this. Uh, and then you can just prove by induction that the V alpha hierarchy agrees all the way up because if it's true at alpha, then they can see all the same subsets. And so it will be true at alpha plus one. And furthermore, because these are transitive, the isomorphism is unique. And so you get through limit stages. And so if the ordinals actually run out earlier, then the whole of V epsilon will be isomorphic to some V gamma, where gamma is the order type of this class of ordinals. But that's a contradiction because it shows that in the epsilon bar universe, it would show the whole universe is bijective with a set. But uh, that can't be true in ZF. And so therefore, uh, it can't be that the ordinals are, one of them is shorter, so they have to have the same height and the V alphas are all isomorphic all the way uniquely, and so the models are isomorphic. So this proof is very similar, of course, to the proof that I described earlier of Ali Eniot. And also, I think of both of these proofs as basically very similar to Zermelo's quasi-categoricity argument that in second order ZFC, uh, any two models, uh, one of them is isomorphic to an initial segment of the other. It's basically the same reasoning. He's arguing on the V alpha hierarchy, 
in getting through successive stages uh, by looking at the power set. And he has full second order logic here. We don't need that because we have the structure available internally, um, but the effect of the argument is the same. Okay, oh, here I'm saying it. So both of the arguments are similar to Zermelo's quasi-categoricity argument. Okay, so let me explain how we get solidity and tightness from that, from Van Anen's theorem. So if you have two models of ZF that are bi-interpretable, well then using Scott's trick and the Kanter schroeder bernstein theorem, we can make a synonymy out of it. So therefore the domains of the structures is, is the same. And so therefore what we really have is a definable relation and each of those relations is definable with respect to the other. And that's gonna give you the full ZF double relation theory and, and therefore the models are isomorphic. So it's just a, a, a consequence of internal categoricity. Okay, uh, so right. So whenever you have that synonymy situation, then you get internal, internal categoricity is really a strengthening of the solidity and tightness results. Okay, so now I wanna point out, because it really bugged me when we had these proofs, in both cases, we're really using the V alpha hierarchy. And I thought that's not right. If you're arguing by induction in set theory, it should be by epsilon induction, epsilon recursion, not recursion on the V alpha hierarchy. And so I really tried hard to prove those theorems using just epsilon recursion. In other words, I, I said, well, suppose that all the elements of, an, of a set X are isomorphic you know, in the interpreted copy and then extend it to X itself. That would be how epsilon recursion works. Um, and I just couldn't get it to work. And so it suggested the question, uh, well, maybe the results fail if you don't have the V alpha hierarchy. For example, if you just have ZFC minus, so you have ZFC, but without the power set axiom, then the V alpha hierarchy doesn't exist as sets. I mean, you still have rank, but the V alpha hierarchy, the V alphas are not sets anymore and that it breaks the, the previous argument. So, Ali Eniot had also observed that his proof seemed to require the full strength of ZF and of KM, and he wanted to know, is that necessary? Um, and so, so basically, I'm, uh, the question is, can you prove tightness and internal categoricity for weak set theory? And that's the question that I wanna answer. Um, so for ZFC minus, without power set, then we do not have internal categoricity. Alfredo and I proved that there's a transitive model of the double membership theory without power set where the structures are not isomorphic to each other. And actually we can do it with a well-founded model. We can make this happen with a well-founded model. So this is a violation of internal categoricity for ZFC mine. Okay, let me tell you how the model goes. So that's just a restatement of the theorem. Okay, for, I'm gonna temporarily assume Lucent's hypothesis, which is that two to the omega equals two to the omega one. This is a forcible assertion, but I'm going to assume that. It follows that H omega 1, these are the hereditarily countable sets. Uh, and H omega 2, those are the sets of size, of hereditary size at most all of 1. Those have the same size, precisely because of this assumption. So therefore, I can fix the bijection between them. And furthermore, I can take the epsilon relation and push it forward to a, whatever relation it becomes under that bijection. And I can take the actual epsilon relation in H omega two and pull it back so that it becomes some relation here by that bijection. And so that bijection is now in isomorphism here. And now I claim it follows that H omega one with these two relations satisfies, well, first of all, it satisfies ZFC minus using epsilon bar as a parameter because I can put any class, any parameter here, any class predicate because it's H omega one. I'm gonna have ZFC minus no matter what predicate I put there. But similarly, this one thinks that I get it with the, with the epsilon tilde relation as a class because I can put any class there that I want and get ZFC minus for this relation. And if I just combine those two observations together and pull the second one back, then what I'm getting really is the double relation theory in the first structure. Okay, so, uh, but uh, 
But of course, H omega one with epsilon and H omega two with epsilon are not isomorphic structures. They're not even elementarily equivalent structures. Okay, so so far I've given an example under the assumption of Lucent's hypothesis, but the point now is that uh, that hypothesis is forcible. And so given any model of ZFC, I can go to the forcing extension where I have this. And in that extension, I have the counterexample model and I can, by Lovenheim's Golem, get a countable transitive model that's a counterexample. And the existence of a countable well-founded model like that is a sigma one, two assertion, which by Schoenfield absoluteness is absolute back to the original model. And so therefore, uh, there, there is a counterexample in the original universe uh, without any force. Okay, so that shows that internal categoricity fails for ZFC minus, but that doesn't give me solidity Joel, of tightness. Yes. Sorry, can I interrupt? Um, sure, please. Um, just a quick question. Um, in the Scott Potter setting, instead, you don't have the power set axiom, but you still can get internal categoricity. So I'm just slightly confused as to how this lines up with the ZFC minus. Is it just that without the power set axiom there, you don't have enough to stratify things? So, uh, right, I'm not, I'm not familiar enough with that example. Uh, so you're, uh, I'm claiming that you cannot prove internal categoricity in ZFC minus. Oh, there's some versions. Okay, not everybody means the same thing by internal categoricity, which might be the explanation. It, it, it might be that, and I also might not quite. So ZFC minus is just ZFC without the power set axiom. That's yeah, that's it. But, okay. Yeah, but said that way, it's ambiguous. Actually, I mean, so <laughs> I mean, you need collection and separation, but not power set. Right. Uh, so an axiom of choice is ambiguous once you drop power set also. So I mean the, the well-ordered principle. Okay. Um, so the way I, when I say internal categoricity, I mean exactly the, the Van Anen theorem that I stated, but I think in some of your work, you mean something slightly different. Um, yeah, that could be right. Yeah. And I think that might be the explanation, but I would really love to talk to you about that actually. Okay. No problem. Thank you. That's yeah. really helpful. Okay. So, okay. So I, I argued that the Van Anen result was stronger than the solidity result. So therefore the failure of the internal categoricity result is weaker than the failure of solidity. So, so far we have a failure of internal categoricity for ZFC minus, but that doesn't mean we have a failure of solidity. So we have to work harder to get failure of solidity. Okay. Um, so what Alfredo and I were able to do is to do that, we were able to prove that it's relatively consistent with ZFC that H omega one and H omega two are by interpretable structures. Um, and of course they're not isomorphic because this one thinks every set is countable and this one thinks that omega one exists. Uh, so the theories are different even, but they can be by interpretable. So let me explain how that goes. So these are of course well-founded models of ZFC minus and they're by interpretable, but they're not isomorphic. Okay, let's, explain it. So look at the Solovey-Tenenbaum model. This is just the usual way of forcing Martin's axiom over L. So in that extension, we have a definable almost disjoint family that's coming from L. Um, uh, so that's a, 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 an omega one sequence of subsets of omega such that any two of them um, uh, have finite intersection, uh, of infinite subsets of omega such that any two of them have finite intersection. Uh, now every element in H omega two is of course has hereditary size omega one. So it's coded ultimately by a subset of omega one, but then by Martin's axiom, every subset of omega one can be almost disjoint encoded by a real, by a subset of omega using this almost disjoint family. Um, and, uh, and therefore inside H omega one, we can define the relations that two reals are equivalent if they code the same set by this double, this two step coding. So a real codes a subset of omega one, which we think of as coding a relation on omega one, which we think of as coding an arbitrary element of H omega two is how the coding is working. Two sets are equivalent if they code the same set and one set is coding an element of another. I mean, is epsilon bar related to another if the, the set that's coded by A is an element of the set that's coded by B. And those are definable uh, relations and we have a definable quotient um, and uh, and the quotient is isomorphic to H omega two. So we have H omega one, we have uh, definable relations on it, 
um, uh, and, and it's isomorphic to h omega two. Okay, and uh, and both of the structures can see how that coding works, and that's enough to make it a by interpretation. Uh, so, in fact, uh, we can get synonymy for h omega one and h omega two. I claim in ZFC there's a there's a definable relation epsilon bar on h omega one which is isomorphic to h omega two to the actual membership relation on h omega two. Um, and it makes these structures into a by interpretation synonymy. Uh, so, and the proof of that is, is just the previous proof, except uh, um, we can't, let's see. So what is the issue? Uh, we, it's the quotient relation. We can't get rid of the equivalence relation because we can't definably pick representatives in ZFC minus, we need some kind of global choice function or something like that. And the point is that uh, Harrington proves that you can have the situation of my previous theorem, even when there is a projectively definable well ordering of the real numbers, and that's enough to pick representatives. And that gets rid of the equivalence relation, and then you can turn that into a synonymy. Okay, uh, so in stronger, large cardinal settings, however, you cannot interpret H omega two inside H omega one. And the, the more specifically, if there's no projectively definable omega one sequence of distinct reals, and that's a consequence of, of ADL of R, for example, then you cannot interpret H omega two inside H omega one. Um, uh, and the reason is that, well, if you could, H omega two, of course, has omega one sequences of distinct reals. And so if you could interpret inside here, then you could define it inside here. And it's close enough to being projectively definable that you could make a projectively definable omega one sequence of distinct reals. But under this assumption, there isn't any such thing and that's why it can't happen. So large cardinals are telling us that there isn't a way to interpret H omega two inside H omega one. And that maybe partly explains why we needed to be forcing over L in order to do it. Okay, uh, so that, uh, um, oh, I see. So far, all I've got is the relative consistency result because I needed to force over L to, to force MA and so on and make this coding. But I claim, in fact, ZFC minus is not solid, not even for well-founded models. Um, and, uh, and, and the proof is that uh, if you look at the forcing extension uh, in which you forced MA, then again, you can apply Schoenfeld absoluteness to pull them back into the original model. Uh, and it follows again that ZFC minus is not tight. Um, and you just write down two different theories extending ZFC minus that describe the situation of the coding that we used. Um, and uh, uh, so, so T2 is asserting ZFC minus plus omega one exists. So it's like the, the omega two model, the theory that is needed in the omega two model. So, and it thinks that every subset of omega one is coded by a real using almost disjoint coding and so on. And T1 asserts CFC minus plus every set is countable. So that's the H omega one theory. And it also says that if you, if you do the interpretation, then you get a model of T2. And if you think about how this is working, then these, uh, um, uh, these theories are bi-interpretable. Okay. Um, so let's now move on to the final section of Zermelo set theory. So, so far we showed that the bi-interpretation phenomenon is not happening with ZFC minus. Um, and so that was an, an instance of a weak set theory, a, a very natural weak set theory with as many, many models of ZFC minus. It's true in every H kappa plus and so on. It, it's used all over set theory, but here's another uh, weak set theory, Zermelo set theory, the original Zermelo set theory. I think we want to add foundation axiom um, uh, as well. Let's see. So the claim is that Zermelo set theory is not solid, not even for well-founded models. And there are bi-interpretable well-founded models of Zermelo set theory that are not isomorphic. So that's a violation of solidity. <clears throat> and it, the theory is not tight. So we have distinct extensions of Zermelo that are bi-interpretable, but not the same theory. Uh, and in fact, every model of ZF is bi-interpretable with a transitive inner model of Zermelo set theory uh, in which the replacement axiom fails. So that's a strong violation of solidity and tightness. Okay, this argument uses 
Matha Adrian Mathias's beautiful slim model construction. So he has this method of building bizarre models of Zermelo set theory, and we're going to use that method to make our interpretation. So the main definition is that a class is fruitful if it's a bunch of transitive sets and it contains every ordinal and it has these closure properties. Um, uh, so I don't want to get too much into it because it's confusing to think about the details of this, um, but I'm just going to give a kind of high level account. So a fruitful class has a bunch of transitive sets. And the main theorem is that if you have a fruitful class, then the union of that class is a transitive model of Zermelo set theory with foundation. And in fact, not just transitive, but super transitive, which means that for every set that it has, it has all of the subsets of that set as well. So it's, it, it's correct about the power set axiom. Okay, and that's a consequence of this axiom four here. It's telling you basically that the thing is correct about power set. Okay, the key idea that Matthias introduced was to, we can construct fruitful classes by specifying rates of growth of, of the sets. Uh, say how they grow in the VNs for finite N. So for example, one such slim model is you allow all sets X into the class provided that there's some uniform bound K so that the rate of growth of the transitive closure of X is bounded by a, a stack of twos of height K with an N on top. So uh, of course the VNs grow the height of Vn is growing, you know, it's the power set each step. So it's growing like a stack of twos. But, but if you keep growing in all the Vns, then the, there wouldn't be a uniform bound on the height of that stack. These Xs have a uniform bound. It's there is a K for all N. Okay, so not every, uh, for example, V omega itself will not obey this growth rate. And therefore V omega won't get into the fruitful class and it won't be in that Zermelo model. <clears throat> so if you, if you use this growth rate, you get a fruitful class, you take its union, that's a Zermelo model in which V omega does not exist as a set. So it's a transitive model of Zermelo, contains all the ordinals, but V omega is not an element of that model. So it's, it's otherwise kind of hard to imagine how you could make such a thing, but that, that's the, the power of Matthias's construction. Okay. So we claim, Alfredo and I claim, that the original ZF model is bi-interpretable with the slim model M that you build this way. And to do that, we, we build what's called the Zermelo tower, and we fix any set in, in M. And then what you do is you, you take, for any X, we're going to define the A interpretation of X, which is obtained by replacing, in the hereditary history of X, replace all the empty sets with A. So, so the interpretation of A, of, of the empty set is A, and the interpretation of XA is just the set of interpretations of YA. So all we've done is we've looked in the hereditary history of X and replaced all the empty sets with A. And the point is that if A has the prescribed rate of growth and is a big rank, then XA will also obey that growth rate because the, growth, the intersection with VN has only to do with this replacing part and not at all to do with this stuff. And so furthermore, this map is an isomorphism of VA with this V sup A. I mean, a V comma epsilon with V sup A. This is an isomorphism. This is not a transitive class. It's highly non-transitive because every set here has A appearing in it, in its hereditary history. Uh, but it, nevertheless, this is an isomorphism. And, uh, and furthermore, the class VA is definable inside M uh, because uh, the sets are in VA just in case all of their epsilon descents, the maximal epsilon descents down to the empty set have to pass through A. Because the only way to keep picking an element of an element of an element of an element and so on is eventually you get down to this A here. So you have to pass through A in order to descend all the way. So that makes V sup A definable inside this Zermelo model M. And therefore that's a bi-interpretation of these two models. But this was a ZF model. And this was a Zermelo model without V omega as an element. So they're definitely not isomorphic. So every ZF model is, is bi-interpretable with a model of Zermelo set theory. And from that, it follows that Zermelo set theory is not 
solid. And then you can turn that into theories. I want to allow some time for questions, so I'm going to maybe uh, skip through this, but that was so far in the models, but you can turn it into the theories also. Um, so let me just skip this part. Oh, okay. Oh, this is an interesting thing. So two theories are model by model by interpretable if every model of one of them is by interpretable with a model of the other. Of course, uh, if the theories are by interpretable, then they're going to be model by model by interpretable because take any model of the first theory and you get a uniform way of, of doing the by interpretation. So the question is really, uh, is this model by model by interpretability carrying the full strength of the by interpretation of theory? Um, and, uh, and the answer is no, it doesn't. And we can have two theories that are model by model by interpretable, but they're not by interpretable. And for example, if you just let T1 be ZF and T2 be this disjunction of ZF with this Zermelo theory M, which is asserting that uh, it's asserting Zermelo plus that the interpretation of the ZF model works. Um, and, and it turns out that these two theories are model by model uh, by interpretable. Uh, because if I have a model of, of T1, of course, I can interpret it by itself. And that's a model of T2. And if I have a model of T2 and it's only coming from this part, then well, what ZM says is that it's bi-interpretable with a model of ZF. So any model of one of these theories is bi-interpretable with a model of the other. Um, but they're not bi-interpretable because if I start with a model of ZM in which ZF fails, so ZM is asserting that I can interpret a model of ZF inside there. So I get that model N and that's a model of T1. But therefore also a model of T2, so I can do it again. I can interpret N star inside N and get another model of ZF. And uh, N and N star are bi-interpretable, but therefore they're isomorphic because these are models of ZF. Um, and now interpreting back, uh, because these are both models of, of T2, if I interpret back to T1 from either N or N, I get M or N because that's how I built them. Um, but those models are not isomorphic and that's a contradiction. I think there's an extremely general model theoretic thing happening here. It has nothing really to do with models of set theory. I think this argument is completely general. Um, okay, so just to summarize, set theory has a robust mutual interpretation phenomenon, but there's no non-trivial by interpretation phenomenon at the level of ZF uh, and higher. Um, and the moral of that is that if you follow mutual interpretations of set theory, you can never go back home to the original model, even though you can go back to a model, a different model of the original theory. Um, but meanwhile, by interpretation does occur in weak set theories, such as CFC minus or Zermelo set theory. And um, even H omega one and H omega two can be by interpretable. And every ZF model is by interpretable with a Zermelo model, which is a definable inner model of it, a transitive inner model. Um, so thank you very much. And it was really a pleasure. So I guess we can have questions now. Uh, I'm not sure there's so many of us. Let me stop the sharing of the slides and then we can see more. Uh, does anyone have any questions? I have a comment. Uh, good news and bad news. Good news is that your suggestion of using interpretations instead of just uh, relative consistency is, I think, exactly what's done by Vopenka and Hayek in the book Theory of Semisets. Oh, right. This is where the Boolean, uh, the Boolean ultra power is also in that book. Boolean ultra power and use the fact that you could use ultra filters yeah. that are all yeah, that, I wasn't. Round. I'm not All, claiming that that method is mine. It goes back really to them in the 60s. It's, uh, so the, the idea of using interpretations as the primary formulation is present there. So I said good news and bad news. The bad news is that as far as I can tell, you can't read that book. Well, <laughs> start at the beginning. But you should read my paper on the Boolean Ultra Power, course, which is very readable. So. But otherwise, forget about it. No, I, I think I agree with that. Uh, so, okay, okay, can I, okay, um, I wonder about 
a couple of directions of sort of that that you can move. So one is allowing um, or elements or a, like a class of or elements. Oh, I see. So that will suddenly, if you've got a class of or elements, that will kill Scott's trick. Um, so, and I like the way that this, by interpretation, then synonymy imposes stricter and stricter standards on what it means for two things to be equivalent. And um, the other direction is foundation versus anti-foundation. So I'm sh I, I would think it would, I, I certainly think that you could prove um, quite easily that ZFC and anti-ZFC are by I mean, interpretable. If you mean Axel's theory, then I think yes. they're at least yes, yes, they're yes, definitely yes. mutually interpretable. I mean, that's that's how one proves the equiconsistency. You I think I would think that, that go ahead. I, I, I would think they're by interpretable, but I think it's inter I, I mean, I'm thinking that you would get you could um, retain this property even if you have in both theories a class of or elements, which is as I say, killing Scott's yeah. trick, and um, you know you could put further further. Um, uh, uh, constraints on the theory. I, I think it's quite a strong phenomenon and I, I like the way that this by interpretation is, is going beyond the mere mutual interpretation. I agree. Really what you would need for the by interpretation is that every set in the anti-foundation world, you would need that every set is bijective with a well-founded set because then it's going to have a code right. which is built and that, that's what right. that's going to come into the by interpretation aspect. Right. So then right. given a well-founded model, you can look at the codes and build the, a, the AFA model. And given an AFA model, if every set is bijective with a well-founded code, then that allows you to go back. Right? But it has to be definably bijective. Right? Oh, yeah. So, yeah. But I, I, th I, th I think you can still do it. I think right. you can do all these things. And even if you, you know, with or without choice, I think, I, think I, um, I, I think it's possible to get a really strong result there saying that sort of foundation and anti-foundation, those two kind of worlds are really the same. However, strict standards you impose on on your notion of equivalence. So I, I like it very much. Thank yeah, you. I think you're right about all that. So I actually um, spoke to Thomas Forster about this some time ago, and he he suggested to me, although I don't remember there being a proof given, uh, that they would actually be synonymous with one another. But um, I think they're certainly by interpretable. I think you could do the, the uh, to make the bijection, you can still do the Kander Schroeder Bernstein thing. Because that's right. going to give a definable bijection. Yeah, that part, so you that won't part need. Also work. Yeah. So that's the that's often the difficult part of synonymy. But you got to get rid of the equivalence relation too, which means basically Scott's trick, or else global choice. So uh, yeah, I would need to think more about the details of that whether it's going to go through. I think it will. Well, is the issue about Scott's trick or circumventing Scott's trick in? In, in the EFA, because you don't have ranks. Or... I think I think you can you can easily do a Scots trick in EFA. That's not a problem. But I mean, not obviously not the same way. Um, right. not, or maybe easily as we all know the same. But I think it can be done. But um, but uh, the but if you have a class of our elements, forget it. You can't use Scots trick, right? Uh, but if. Uh... If you might have global choice though, still. So. Oh, so if you're, you mean if your theory has a global choice operation? Yeah. Yeah, then you would yeah. be okay, right? Yes, but if you don't, then you can have a then... proper, you know, an ordered sequence of real elements, and uh, and then you could re yeah. you could still do stuff. Sure. sure, sure. But if you don't have that, so I'm imposing sort of you know stricter and strict, make, making the job um, harder and harder. I still think it's achievable, despite those constraints. That's all. Awesome. Are there other questions? Sorry. I have a comment, uh, Joe, but sure. this is Ali speaking, but I'm noticing that Neil Barton has already uh, sent a chat message saying he has a question. So maybe he should ask his question oh, first. Oh, I see. I'm not seeing the chat. Okay, let me pull that up. Oh, I see. I, either way is good. I don't, I don't. Okay, yeah, jump in, Neil. That's fine. Thank you, Ali. Oh, okay, yeah, thanks. Um, I have, so I have a, a technical question and a philosophical question. So. The technical question is um, what the state of play is for these interpretability result, uh, results in the case of class forcing. So there we're not guaranteed the Boolean completion. No. I think it's unless we have the odd CC. So if that's a strict bound or there's some clever work around there, that's a technical question. And the philosophical question is um, you said there's sort of no way of going back home given these interpretations. So is, I mean, 
you might think if you're looking at the universe view versus the multiverse view, let's say, that the kind of simulations the universe theorist provides will always lose information somehow. Is that is that something you're driving at with this work or yes. is that too strong? <laughs> <laughs> Right. For your first question, I think that's really a fascinating question and I don't have anything to say about it right now, but I'm going to definitely be thinking about that because it's a really good uh, question. So the, I'm understanding your question is, does uh, set forcing provides, in the general case with parameters, provides this uh, interpretation aspect and the question is, can we do it with class forcing? And I just don't know, right. how, but I want to definitely figure that out. I mean, I think with the odd CC for your partial order, it should be oh, fine. Oh yeah, then it's no problem because then yeah, you yeah. have a completion, right? Yeah, so right, if the forcing right. is odd CC, then you can build the completion inside right, right, the model. Right. But the hard case is when you don't have that, and then it's not clear uh, what's going on. Um, you can't have the 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 set complete Boolean algebra. Right. I mean, the, I'm sorry, the class complete Boolean algebra port um, in the general case, and so there isn't any Boolean algebra. And, but maybe you, maybe you can still do it somehow. I'm not quite sure. I want to definitely think about that. For your other question, I think really that's, that's an extremely important issue. So if, if you're a universist, I mean, as opposed to a multiversist, and you want to say, well, look, uh, I'm just going to use interpretations, then, uh, and that, you know, any of these models, you know, CFC plus large cardinals or plus determinacy or plus inner model of large cardinals, are just as good as each other because these theories mm -hmm. are mutually interpretable, then uh, the, the criticism of that view is to say, well, look, every time you jump from one model to another by your interpretation, uh, you're, you're eventually getting into the ill-founded models when you go back because, um, right. and so, but of course, most of the people who are defending that view are, in my experience, also defending the idea that we only care about well-founded models and and they want definitely right. to stay with the well-founded models. And so the point of right. these results is that we can't have both of those things. Cool, thanks. Are there I, any other questions? I have an extremely naive question. I'm uh, not sure. So um, <clears throat> I, I think I must have mis uh, misunderstood you or, or else I'm, uh, there are subtleties I don't quite understand. Uh, you, you, said, you said first that uh, a theory is uh, Two theories are mutually interpretable if any model of one is interpretable, uh, interpretable in a, a model of the other, right? Uh, in, every, in every model of the other. No, it has to be uniform. For theories to be mutually interpretable means that you can write down a formula, a single formula that's going to, in the first theory, define a domain of a structure and you can write down other formulas that interpret the relational structure of the other theory and so on, such that the theory proves that that uh, provides a model of the other theory, and conversely. So it's not just model by model mutually interpretable. The, it's a kind of uniform version of that. I see. Okay. Thank you. Joel, can I ask my question now? Yes, please, Ali. I'm sorry. Thank you. Uh, so first of all, thank you very much for a nice talk. Um, I want to... Uh, point out um, a question that your work with uh, Alfredo goes a long way to answer that I was posing my paper. Um, and, I, and I think this question is both interesting um, mathematically and also foundationally. Um, so um, the question is whether, we, we know that ZF is a tight theory and um, you and Alfredo have shown that when we look at the Sermelo set theory or with ZFC with our power set, tightness need not be true. Uh, at the end of my paper, I pointed out that also tightness need not be true uh, when we draw foundation or um, uh, extensionality. Um, and so the question is whether there's a proper sub theory or of Sermelo Frankel set theory that is tight. And I think by proving that there is no such theory, it would say something important about the Mello Frankel set theory. And one could even make it a little more precise, maybe what, not more precise, sorry, maybe easier to answer. Uh, is there an extension of uh, ZF C minus if that is tight, but not exactly ZFC? 
But I thought so you, I didn't mention it, but you told me, uh, and I think it's in your paper, that if you have ZFC minus plus, every set is countable. Isn't that tight? Again? That's right. That ends up being uh, bi interpretable with, um, with Kelly Morse set theory. So that's like the, the H omega one case. If you have yeah. two models that both think that they're H, H omega one and they're and they're bi interpretable, uh, then they're isomorphic. Is that is that a correct way to say it? Uh, is this your theorem? Uh, let's see. Um, yeah, it is certainly true that uh, if we look at ZFC minus plus every set is uh, countable, then that's bi interpretable with second order arithmetic. So maybe I should rephrase the question. Basically, that gives you H omega one. So you uh, want an extension of ZFC, but contained in ZF? Yes. Right? I mean, yes, exactly. that's what your question is exactly. really about, exactly. right? Exactly. A proper sub theory would be contained in ZF, exactly. And that would completely, um, I mean, that version of the question would, would completely answer um, the question, are we using all of ZF, ZF uh, in, in the tightness result? Yes. And the interesting so I, I thought about that question and Alfredo and I thought a long time about, about it, but we didn't. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, it's a very good question and a very hard question, I think. So I don't really have any insight on it. Well, uh, and, uh, thank you for letting me know about that. Uh, I, uh, because of, of the fact that this is also a seminar with um, a number of distinguished uh, uh, participants, I, I, I thought it's good for this to be also far from the open for people to think about. Especially because even in the arithmetical setting, uh, there's an analog of this question. Um, because PA is known to be tight, and the question is you know, whether there's a proper sub theory of PA which is tight. Oh, I see. And, uh, so the, so the, the analogy yeah. is what PA with ZFC minus and, and. Exactly. Okay. Right. Yeah, right. I thought about this. <laughs> I thought a little about this, and uh, I couldn't draw the the similarity be, the 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 um i was trying more in the case of z uh, uh z and zf and seeing the correlation with the pa case but um it's quite it's quite hard to separate the deduction axiom for pa into a version of uh replacement and separation you know like this is the the, the hard part of it so maybe i should point out uh, so pa is quite interpretable with a version of set theory that is obtained by dropping infinity uh, but adding transit closure um yes and um right and 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 um in in my paper i point out point out a result that is jointly due to um this are me and, um, and Jim Schmerl, which says that if you drop uh, transitive closure, then um, that theory of finite set theory without transitive closure is not tight. So we have something mm -hmm. analogous to your result with, with Joe about in, this, in the yes. uh, finite set theory thing. Uh, but that's just the only result that, that I know of. And it seems to be there's a, there's a bunch of questions here about Oh, I see you're saying PA plus the failure of transitive closure is like Zermelo because Zermelo also can't prove this kind of thing. Is that what you mean? Or? Um, it is, yes, I guess that analogy could be, could be if, if, I guess you, I don't think of it as PA, I think of it as finite set theory. Right, right, okay, that's what I meant, right, yes. Right, so finite set theory, but with transitive closure not being as one. Right. Uh, it used to be thought as being bi interpretable with, with PA, but then uh, right. when people wrote out the proof, it became clear that transit closure is needed. And it turns out it's really needed, not but, just. I mean, the isn't proof, another way of thinking about that result, though, is just that if you state the foundation axiom in terms of epsilon induction, or epsilon recursion, then you get transitive closure. Precisely. Um, precisely. The kind of precisely. artifact yeah, of, yeah. of. Exactly. I mean, in ZF, we can state foundation just as regularity, but. But it, once you drop too much of the theory, then you can't prove the equivalence anymore of that. And so you really want, what you really want, of course, is epsilon recursion. And then it becomes equivalent to the stronger version. Absolutely, yes. Transitive closure will buy it for it, yeah. Okay, are there any other questions or comments? I've got a, I've got a question, if that's okay. 
Sure. Um, thank you. Um, so you said one could uh, interpret ZFC plus the failure of CH in ZF um, by taking the Boolean ultra power construction, um, yes. basically by taking an inner model and then um, using the complete, the complete Boolean uh, ultra power and right. do, do the forcing thing, if you will. Um, but you also said that generosity is not necessary. Um, how, does that, how does that reconcile? What's the reason for why generosity is not, not needed? Well, I mean, of course, when we do forcing, we usually take generic filters and build the forcing extension from that generic filter, and the generic filter exists in the forcing extension. But the Boolean ultra power method is not the same thing as going to the forcing extension by that ultra filter, and it's a very subtle difference. Um, and the point is that you should think of it more like an ultra power construction than like a forcing construction. And uh, although in print, many people say that uh, they, they want the ultra filter to be generic. In fact, you don't need it at all to do the Boolean ultra power construction. And that's exactly what makes it work as an interpretation because you can take the ultra filter inside the original model. Um, and so uh, it's just like taking an ultra power of the universe by an ultra filter, except you're not using a power set algebra, you're using a, a complete Boolean algebra. And, uh, and then you can, prove that not only is V elementary in its Boolean ultra power, but the Boolean ultra power carries this extra structure which satisfies the theory of the forcing extension. So you're starting with a model V and taking its Boolean ultra power and it has an elementary embedding there by you. And then that model has, you can define a, a, another larger model which is the forcing extension of the ultra power. So the whole Boolean ultra power construction is like taking an ultra power and then building an actual forcing extension of that ultra power, but the whole construction takes place inside the original model in a definable way, uh, definable from the Boolean algebra and the ultra filter. I don't know if that helps or not, but that's basically what's mm -hmm. going on. It certainly does, it certainly does, thank you. Well, I guess, unless there's one last question, we're almost out of time. So, yeah, sorry, can I go back a little bit to sure. Ali and Yet's question about um, whether you're using the whole of ZFC? Um, and also back to your comment about exactly how you formulate certain things, you know, um, once you've dropped uh, background principles, then right. it gets very sensitive to formulation. So the more I thought about it, the more I'm certain that you can prove the tightness of the Scott Potter um, style approaches because all of those allow you to stratify everything into nice well-founded ranks and it's that which enables everything to to go through so i mean one way of looking at the zfc stuff is to say well the way you've accidentally formulated it is that you needed replacement um, and various other principles in order to make sure that you could prove that every set belonged to a nice well-founded rank so you will have to use the full power of ZFC if you formulated it that way. Um, but if you were to start with a different formulation, the sort of minimal formulation, which said everything is in a well-founded rank. Because are you, before we were talking about formulation of what it means to have internal categoricity, but I think now, yeah. what are you talking about? Or? So, oh, sorry, um, the, the, just the precise sensitivity of, for example, um, do you formulate fa uh, well-foundedness by uh, saying, um, you know, the, the epsilon induction version that you offered versus the, right. um, you know, that sort of level of sensitivity is what I have in mind. Oh, I see. Yeah. So um, I just meant the, you might well need to use every axiom uh, of ZF um, and C in order to get all of this working. But there's a, a sub-theory of that which looks rather different um, just in the way that it's formulated for which you can prove all of the the tightness and solidity results um, and it's certainly you should i'm convincing myself i'm morally certain that you could do it in the scott potter setting but i would now need to go away and check right well i would definitely be interested in talking with you more about that so let's let's stay in touch cool yeah well I guess we're already past time so uh let me close the meeting now and thank you all we're coming next Wednesday in one week. Uh, we have Ali Anayat speaking about Leibnizian and anti-Leibnizian motifs in set theory. Is that right, Ali? That's right, yeah. Okay, and uh, so please come back next week, 4 p.m. UK time, and uh, I hope to see you all there. Bye.